Hello and good evening to all the travellers of the vast expanses of the internet. Welcome to my stream, Dorkly Lit. My name is Mitek Shung and I'm gonna read for you and for myself the Dungeon Master's Guide to Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Chapter 5 Adventure Environments Many D&D adventures resolve around a dungeon setting. Dungeons in D&D include great halls and tombs, subterranean monster lairs, labyrinths, natural caverns extending for miles beneath the surface of the world, and ruined castles. Not every adventure takes place in a dungeon. A wilderness trek across the desert of desolation, or a harrowing journey into the jungles of the Isle of Dread can be an exciting adventure in its own right. In the great outdoors, dragons wheel across the sky in search of prey. Tribes of hobgoblins pour forth from their grim fortresses to wage war against their neighbours. Ogres plunder farmsteads for food, and monstrous spiders drop from the web-shrouded canopies of trees. Within a dungeon, adventurers are constrained by walls and doors around them, but in the wilderness, adventurers can travel in almost any direction they please. Therein lies the key difference between dungeons and wilderness. It's much easier to predict where the adventuring party might go in the dungeon, because their options are limited, less so in the wilderness. Villages, towns and cities are cradles of civilization and dangerous world, but they too offer op opportunities for adventure. Encounters with monsters might seem unlikely within the city's walls. Evil, after all, takes many forms, and urban settings aren't always sa the safe havens they seem to be. The chapter provides an overview of these three environments, plus a few unusual environments, taking you through the process of creating an adventure location with plenty of random tables to inspire you. Dungeons Some dungeons are old strongholds abandoned by the folk who built them. Others are natural caves or weird lairs carved out by foul monsters. They attract evil cults, monster tribes and reclusive creatures. Dungeons are also home to ancient treasures, coins, gems, magic items and other valuables hidden away in the darkness, often guarded by traps or jealously kept by the monsters that have collected them. Building a dungeon When you set out to create a dungeon, think about its distinctive qualities. For example, a dungeon that serves as a hobgoblin stronghold has a different quality from an ancient temple inhabited by Yuan-T. This section lays out a process for creating a dungeon and bringing it to life. Dungeon Location You can use the dungeon location table to determine the locale of your dungeon. You can roll on the table or choose an entry that inspires you. D100 1 to 4 A building in a city, 5 to 8 catacombs or sewers beneath a city, 9 to 12 beneath a farmhouse, 13 to 16 beneath a graveyard, 17 to 22 beneath a ruined castle, 23 to 26 beneath a ruined city, 27 to 30 beneath a temple, 31 to 34 in a chasm, 35 to 38 in a cliff face, 39 to 42 in a desert, 43 to 46 in a forest, 47 to 50 in a glacier, 51 to 54 in a gorge, 55 to 58 in a jungle, 59 to 62 in a mountain pass, 63 to 66 in a swamp, 67 to 70 beneath or on top of a mesa, 71 or 74 in sea caves, 75 to 78 in several corrected mesas, 79 to 82 on a mountain peak, 83 to 86 on a promontory, 87 to 90 on an island, 91 to 95 underwater, 96 to 100. Roll on the exotic location table, no cases there's 5% to get an exotic location. I wonder what these are gonna be. They better be really exotic if, it, if there's only 5%. For getting one of these, any one, and for getting a single one, there's like 0.25 if I'm thinking right. Anyway, d20. 1. Among the branches of a tree. 2. Around the geyser. Geyser? Or how do you read that? 3. Beneath a waterfall. Behind a waterfall. 4. Buried in an avalanche. 5. Buried in a sandstorm. 6. Buried in volcanic ash. 7. Castle or structure sunken in a swamp. 8. Castle or structure at the bottom of a sinkhole. 9. Floating on the sea. 10. In a meteorite. 11 on a demi plane or in a pocket dimension. 12 in an area devastated by magical catastrophe. 13 on a cloud. 14 in the Feywild. 15 in the Shadow Fell. 16 on an island in an underground sea. 17 in a volcano. 18 on the back of a gargantuan living creature. 19 sealed inside the magical dome of force. 20 inside the modern Canaan's magnificent mansion. This one's interesting. 
the inside the moon canons magnificent mansion there is apparently a spell called dust and it creates a, a demi plane that has a huge estate a huge house decorated with stuff of the casters choosing and filled with servants and all that stuff it would look i i mean the way i imagine it would probably look like the beast's castle from beauty and the beast disney's beauty and the beast the animated one that's the good one dungeon creator a dungeon reflects its creators so if your dungeon is a is a foul damp place that somehow reflects you as a, as a human being a dungeon reflects its creators. A lost temple of the Yuan Ti choked by overgrown jungle plants might feature ramps instead of stairs. Caverns carved by a beholder's disintegration eye ray have walls that are unnaturally smooth. And the beholder's lair might include vertical shafts connecting different levels. Amphibious creatures such as Quartoa and Aboleths use water to protect the innermost reaches of their lairs from air breathing intruders. Details bring a dungeon's settings personality to life. Great bearded faces might be carved on the doors of a dwarven stronghold, or might be defaced by the Nords who live there now. Spiderweb decorations, torture chambers, and slave pens might be common features in a vault built by the Drow, telling something about that location and its occupants. The dungeon creator table includes creatures that typically build dungeons. You can choose a creator from the table or roll randomly, or choose some other dungeon builder appropriate for your campaign. Dungeon creator, d20. 1. Beholder. 2 to 4. Cult or religious group? Roll on the cult and religious groups table to determine specifics. 5 to 8. Wolves. 9. Elves, including Rao. 10. Giants. 11. Hobgoblins. 12 to 15. Humans. Roll on the NPC alignment and NPC class tables to determine specifics. 16. Quartora. 17. Lich. 18. Mind Flayers. 19. Yuan T. 2. No Creator. Natural Caverns. Cults and religious groups. D20. 1. Demon Worshipping Cult 2. Devil Worshipping Cult 3-4. to four, Elemental Air Cult 5-6. to six, Elemental Earth Cult 7-8. to eight, Elemental Fire Cult 9-10. to ten, Elemental Water Cult 11-15. to 15, Worshippers of an Evil Deity 16-17. to 17, Worshippers of a Good Deity 18-20. to 20, Worshippers of a Neutral Deity NPC Alignment D20 1 to 2 lawful good, 3 to 4 neutral good, 5 to 6 chaotic good, 7 to 9 lawful neutral, 10 to 11 neutral, 12 chaotic neutral, 13 to 15 lawful evil, 16 to 18 neutral evil, 19 to 20 chaotic evil. So chaotic neutral is the rarest of them all, I guess. Chaotic neutral people don't build dungeons apparently, or seldom build dungeons. If you're chaotic neutral, you're half as likely to build a dungeon as any other alignment. Isn't it interesting, statistically speaking, for the world of D&D? <laughs> anyway, NPC class, D20. 1. Barbarian, 2. Bard, 3-4. to four, Cleric, 5. Druid, 6-7. to seven, Fighter, 8. Monk, 9. Paladin, 10. Ranger, 11-14. to 14, Rogue, 15. Sorcerer, 16. Warlock, 17-20. to 20, Wizard. Dungeon Purpose Except in the case of a natural cavern, a dungeon is crafted and inhabited for a specific purpose that influences its design and features. You can choose a purpose for the dungeon purpose table. Roll one at random or use your own ideas. That's good advice, really. D20 1. Death Trap 2 to 5. Lair 6. Maze 7 to 9. Mine 10. Planar Gate 1 to 14. Stronghold 15 to 17. Temple or Shrine 18 to 19. Tomb 20. Treasure Vault Death Trap This dungeon is built to eliminate any creature that dares enter it. A Death Trap might guard the treasure of an insane wizard, or it might be designed to lure adventurers to their demise for some nefarious purpose, such as to feed the souls to religious phylactery. Lair A lair is a place where monsters live. Typical lairs include ruins and caves. Maze A maze is intended to deceive or confuse who enters it. Some mazes are elaborate obstacles that protect treasure, while others are gauntlets for prisoners banished there to be hunted and devoured by the monsters within. Mine An abandoned mine can quickly become infested with monsters, while miners who delve too deep can break through into the Underdark. Planar Gate Dungeons built around planar portals are often transported by the planar energy seeping out through these portals. Stronghold A stronghold dungeon provides a secure base of operations for villains and monsters. It is usually ruled by a powerful individual such as a wizard, vampire or dragon and it's larger and more complex than a simple lair. Temple or shrine This dungeon is consecrated to a deity or other planar entity. 
The entity's worshippers control the dungeon and conduct their rites there. Tomb. Tombs are magnets for treasure hunters, as well as monsters that hunger for the bones of the dead. Treasure Vault. Built to protect powerful magic items and great material wealth, Treasure Vault dungeons are heavily guarded by monsters and traps. History. In most cases, the original architects of a dungeon are long gone and the question of what happened to them can help shape the dungeon's current state. The dungeon history table notes key events that can transform a site from its original purpose into a dungeon for adventurers to explore. Particularly old dungeons can have a history that consists of multiple events, each of which transforms the site in some way. Dungeon history. D20. 1-3. Abandoned by creators. 4. Abandoned due to a plague. 5 to 8 conquered by invaders, 9 to 10 creators destroyed by attacking raiders, 11 creators destroyed by discovery made within the site, 12 creators destroyed by internal conflict, 13 creators destroyed by magical catastrophe, 14 to 15 creators destroyed by natural disasters, 16 location cursed by the gods and shunned, 17 to 18 original creators still in control, 19 overrun by planar creatures, 20 site of a great miracle. I guess building dungeons is risky business. You get destroyed by stuff a lot, or conquered, or that sort of thing. You can! You can have a miracle happen in your dungeon, I guess. If you're very lucky, if you're all to 20, but generally that's dangerous business. Dungeon inhabitants. After a dungeon's creators depart, anyone or anything might move in. Intelligent monsters, mindless dungeon scavengers, predators, and prey alike can be drawn to dungeons. The monsters in a dungeon are more than a collection of random creatures that happen to live near one another. Fungi, vermin, scavengers and predators can coexist in a complex ecology, alongside intelligent creatures who share living space through elaborate combinations of domination, negotiation and bloodshed. Characters might be able to sneak into a dungeon, ally with one faction or play factions against each other to reduce the threat of the more powerful monsters. For example, in a dungeon inhabited by mind flayers and their goblinoid thralls, the adventurers might try to incite the goblins, hobgoblins and bugbirds to revolt against their illicit masters. Dungeon Factions A dungeon is sometimes dominated by a single group of intelligent humanoids. Whether a tribe of orcs that have taken over a cavern complex or a gang of trolls inhabiting an above-ground ruin. Other times, particularly in large dungeons, multiple groups of creatures share space and compete for resources. For example, Orcs that dwell in the mines of a ruined dwarf citadel might skirmish constantly against the hobgoblins that hold the citadel's upper tiers. Mind flayers that have established a colony in the lowest levels of the mines could manipulate and dominate key hobgoblins in an attempt to wipe out the orcs. And all the while, a hidden cell of drow scouts watches and plots to slay the mind flayers and enslave whatever creatures are left. It's easy to think of a dungeon as a collection of encounters with the adventurers kicking down door after door and killing whatever lies behind. But the ebb and flow of power between groups in a dungeon provides plenty of opportunities for more subtle interaction. Dungeon denizens are used to striking unlikely alliances, and adventurers are a wild card that many monsters seek to exploit. Intelligent creatures in a dungeon have gold. Whether as simple as short-term survival, or as ambitious as claiming the entire dungeon as the first step in founding an empire, such creatures might approach adventurers with an offer of alliance, hoping to prevent the characters from laying waste to their land and to secure aid against their enemies. Bring the NPC leaders of such groups to life as described in Chapter 4. Fleshing out their personalities, goals and ideals, then use those elements to shape a response to the arrival of adventurers in their territory. It could be interesting, but I have to, you have to be very careful not to do it too rigidly, too um, forcefully, because it's gonna look like a video game dungeon if you do it like that. And that's always bad. You want to do it to feel like a part of a, of a story. Dungeon Ecology an inhabited dungeon has its own ecosystem. The creatures that live there need to eat, drink, breathe and sleep just as the creatures in the wilderness do. Predators need to be able to seek prey, and intelligent creatures search for lairs offering the best combinations of air, food, water and security. Keep these factors in mind when designing a dungeon you want the players to believe in. If a dungeon doesn't have some internal logic to it, adventurers will find it difficult to make reasonable decisions within that environment. For example, characters who find a pool of fresh water in a dungeon might make the logical assumption that many of the creatures inhabiting the dungeon come to that spot to drink. The adventurers might set an ambush at the pool, 
Likewise, locked doors or even doors that require hands to open can restrict the movement of some creatures. If all the doors in a dungeon are closed, the players might wonder how the carrion crawlers or sturges they repeatedly encounter manage to survive. That would be pretty harsh for a sturge. Carrion crawler is at least pretty big, so he could maybe bash the door down. Encounter difficulty, you might be inclined to increase the encounter difficulty as the adventurers descend deep into the dungeon as a way to keep the dungeon challenging as the characters gain levels or to ratchet up the tension. However, this approach can turn the dungeon into a grind. A better approach is to include encounters of varying difficulty throughout. The contrast between easy and hard encounters, as well as simple and complex encounters, encourages characters to vary their tactics and keeps the encounters from seeming too similar. Mapping a dungeon. Every dungeon needs a map showing its layout. The dungeon's location, creator, purpose, history and inhabitants should give you a starting point for designing your dungeon map. If you need further inspiration, you can find maps that have been made freely available for use on the internet or even use a map of real-world location. Alternatively, you can borrow a map from a published adventure or randomly generate a dungeon complex using the tables presented in Appendix A. A dungeon can range in size from a few chambers in a ruined temple to a huge complex of rooms and passages extending hundreds of feet in all directions. The adventurer's goal often lies as far from the dungeon entrance as possible, forcing characters to delve deeper underground or push farther into the heart of the complex. A dungeon is most easily mapped on graph paper, with each square on the paper representing an area of 10 feet by 10 feet. If you play with miniatures on a grid, you might prefer a scale where each square represents 5 feet, or you can subdivide your 10 foot grid into a 5 foot grid when you draw your maps for combat. When you draw your map, keep the following points in mind. Asymmetrical rooms and map layouts make a dungeon less predictable. Think in three dimensions. Stairs, ramps, platforms, ledges, balconies, pits and other changes of elevation make a dungeon more interesting and make combat encounters in these areas more challenging. Give the dungeon some wear and tear. Unless you want to stress that the dungeon's builders were extraordinarily skillful, collapsed passages can be commonplace, cutting off formerly connected sections of the dungeon from each other. Past encounters might have opened chasms within the dungeon, splitting rooms and corridors to make interesting obstacles. Incorporate natural features into even a constructed dungeon. An underground stream might run through the middle of a dwarven stronghold, causing variation in the shapes and sizes of rooms and necessitating features such as bridges and drains. Add multiple entrances and exits. Nothing gives the players a stronger sense of making real decisions than having multiple ways to enter a dungeon. Add secret doors and secret rooms to reward players who take the time to search for them. If you need help creating a dungeon map from scratch, see Appendix A. Actually, I wanted to feature a dungeon in my first adventure, the one I, I, I keep mentioning, the one in the desert in the leper colony. I wanted to feature a dungeon, but it didn't occur to me that I might want to have two entrances. How to enter the dungeon is going to be a, a crucial point of the adventure, it's not going to be very easy to enter. I might think of two entrances and make entering from either one of them difficult, but make each difficult in its own way. If I could come up with, with two good ones, I'm gonna I'm gonna get, make it so that there's two at least. If I can come up with three good ones, I'm gonna come up with three good ones and put three in. And if I'm not if I'm if I'm not gonna come up with anything good, I'm just gonna go with one entrance. Like oh like the pathetic human being that I am. Dungeon features. The atmosphere and physical characteristics of dungeons vary as widely as their origins. An old crypt might have some stone walls and loose wooden doors, an odor of decay and no light other than what adventurers bring with them. A volcanic lair might have smooth stone walls hollowed out by past eruptions, doors of magically reinforced brass, a smell of sulfur and light provided by jets of flame in every hall and room. Walls. Some dungeons have walls of masonry, others have walls of solid rock, hewn with tools to give them rough, chiseled look or worn smooth by the passage of water or lava. An above-ground dungeon might be made of wood or composite materials. Walls are sometimes adorned with murals, frescoes, bas reliefs and lighting fixtures such as sconces or torch brackets. A few even have secret doors built into them. A few, come on. Secret doors are a staple.
doors, dungeon doorways might be set within arches and lintels. They might be festooned with carvings of gargoyles or leering faces or engraved with sigils that reveal clues as to what lies beyond. Festooned, good word. Stuck doors. Dungeon doors often become stuck when they are not used frequently. Opening a stuck door requires a successful strength check. Chapter 8. Running a game provides guidelines for setting the DC. Lock doors. Characters who don't have the key to a locked door can pick the lock with a successful dexterity check. Doing so requires thieves tools and proficiency in their use. They can also force the door with a successful strength check, smash the door to pieces by dealing enough damage to it, or use a knock spell or similar magic. Chapter 8 provides guidelines for setting DCs and assigning statistics to doors and other objects. Bar door. A bar door is similar to a locked door except that there's no lock to pick and the door can be opened normally from the bad side using an action to lift the bar from its braces. Secret doors. A secret door is crafted to blend in the wall that surrounds it. Sometimes faint cracks in the wall or scuff marks on the door betray the secret door's presence. Actually on the topic of stuck doors. Stuck door, it's a rather realistic idea, right? If you, if you left a door in a dungeon closed for 100 years, it would probably be stuck. But a lot of the times there is no point in making a door stuck and making all players roll a strength DC to see if they can open it because eventually they're gonna find a way to open it and it brings nothing to the narrative for the players to, to wail at the door for 30 minutes to try and open it. It wouldn't burn it down. Yeah, for example, if everybody failed uh, a strength check, they would eventually come up with burning it down, right? Or just breaking the hinges with the maces or whatever. That puts a damper on the tempo of your adventure. That would be ridiculous. However, if the door is strategically placed, for example, if you, if you have a stuck door on an escape route that the players want to pursue, that has a, a real legit point of being stuck and it's a real legit idea to have your players roll a strength DC to open that. That would make sense. Or for example, if there's something behind the door where they might make a rocket and the thing is gonna escape or take its treasure and escape. That's also a decent reason to have them roll a strength check, but don't just place stuck doors all over if, it, if you know it's not gonna do anything. It's just gonna slow down your game. Anyway, detecting a secret door. Use the character's passive wisdom perception scores to determine whether anyone in the party notices a secret door without actively searching for it. Characters can also find a secret door by actively searching the location where the door is hidden, then succeeding on a wisdom perception check. Set an appropriate DC for the check, see chapter 8. Now imagine, back on the topic of the, of the stuck door, imagine if everyone failed a strength saving throw and they went back from the dungeon to buy a crowbar or buy timber to burn it down. That would be horrible from a cinematic, make our story interesting kind of point of view. Opening a secret door. Once a secret door is detected, a successful intelligence investigation check might be required to determine how to open it if the opening mechanism isn't obvious. Set the DC according to the difficulty guidelines in chapter 8. If adventurers can't determine how to open a secret door, breaking it down is always an option. Treat it as a locked door made of the same material as the surrounding wall and use the guidelines in chapter 8 to determine appropriate DCs or statistics. I actually don't know how, how, how you break a door in 5th edition. Yeah, this is 5th edition. And I actually don't know how you break a door in 5th edition. I assume you can just deal damage to it and it's gonna break eventually. I guess we'll get to it. Concealed doors. A concealed door is a normal door that is hidden from view. A secret door is carefully crafted to blend into its surrounding surface, whereas a concealed door is most often hidden by mundane means. It might be covered by a tapestry covered with plaster or, in the case of a concealed trap door, hidden underneath a rug. Normally, no ability check is required to find a concealed door. A character need only look in the right place or take the right steps to reveal the door. However, you can use the character's passive wisdom perception scores to determine whether any of them notices tracks or signs of a tapestry or rug having been recently disturbed. Porticulus. Porticulus? Is that how you read it? No, I don't know. Portcullis. 
portcullis is a set of vertical bars made of wood or iron, reinforced with one or more horizontal bars, dear god I hope they don't use the word again. It blocks a passage or archway until it's raised up into the ceiling by a winch and a chain. The main benefit of a portcullis is that it blocks a passage while still allowing guards to watch the area beyond and make ranged attacks or cast spells through it. Winching a portcullis up or down requires an action. If a character can't reach the winch, usually because it is on the other side of the portcullis, lifting the portcullis or bending its bars far enough apart to pass through them requires a successful strength check. The DC of the check depends on the size and weight of the portcullis or the thickness of its bars. To determine an appropriate DC, see chapter 8. Darkness and Light Darkness is the default condition inside an underground complex or in the interior of above-ground ruins but an inhabited dungeon might have light sources. In subterranean settlements, even races that have dark vision use fire for warmth, cooking and defense, but many creatures have no need of warmth or light. Adventurers must bring their own sources of light into dusty tombs where only undead stand guard, abandoned ruins teeming with predatory monsters and oozes, natural caverns where sightless creatures hunt. The light of a torch or lantern helps the character see over a short distance, but other creatures can see that light source from far away. Bright light in an environment of total darkness can be visible for miles. Though a clear line of sight over such distance is rare underground. Even so, adventurers using light sources in a dungeon often attract monsters, just as dungeon features that shed light from phosphorescent fungi to the glow of magical portals can draw adventurers' attention. Air quality. Subterranean tunnels and above ground ruins are often enclosed spaces with little airflow, though it's rare for a dungeon to be sealed so tightly that adventurers have trouble breathing, the atmosphere is often stifling and oppressive. What's more, odors linger in a dungeon and can be magnified by the stillness of the atmosphere. Sounds. A dungeon's enclosed geography helps channel sound. The groaning creak of an opening door can echo down hundreds of feet of a passageway. Louder noises such as the clanging hammers of a forge or the din of battle can reverberate through an entire dungeon. Many creatures that live underground use such sounds as a way of locating prey or to go and alert at any sound of an adventuring party's intrusion. Dungeon Hazards The hazards described here are but a few examples of the environmental dangers found underground and in other dark places. Dungeon hazards are functionally similar to traps, which are described at the end of this chapter. Detecting a hazard. No ability check is required to spot a hazard unless it's hidden. A hazard that resembles something benign, such as a patch of slime or mold, can be correctly identified with a successful intelligence nature check. Use the guidelines in chapter 8 to set an appropriate DC for any check made to spot or recognize a hazard. Hazard severity. To determine a hazard's deadliness relative to the characters, think of the hazard as a trap and compare the damage it deals to the party's level using damage severity by level table later in the chapter. The table also appears in chapter 8. These are interesting. They don't appear in, in video games based on, on d and I've never seen brown mold or green slime or webs or yellow mold. Brown mold feeds on warmth, drawing heat from anything around it. A patch of brown mold typically covers 10 foot square and the temperature within 30 feet of it is always frigid. When a creature moves to within 5 feet of the mold for the first time on a turn or it starts its turn there, it must make a DC 12 constitution saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 cold damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. Green slime is similar to gelatinous cube. I don't know, I actually assumed that uh, that they meant something else than oozes and the slime monsters. I assumed like it's an inanimate slime, a slime that doesn't move, but we're about to get to it and we'll see what it is. Uh, brown mold is immune to fire and any source of fire brought within 5 feet of a patch causes it to instantly expand outward in the direction of the fire, covering 10 foot square area. With the source of the fire at the center of the area, a patch of brown mold exposed to an effect that deals cold damage is instantly destroyed. Green slime. This acidic slime devours flesh, organic material and metal on contact. Bright green, wet and sticky, it clings to walls, floors and ceilings in patches. A patch of green slime covers 5 foot square, has blind sight out of... Okay, so it moves because it has blind sight. It can see actually. 
out to a range of 30 feet and drops from walls and ceilings when it detects movement below. Beyond that, it has no ability to move. A creature aware of the slime's presence can avoid being struck by it with a successful DC 10 dexterity saving throw. Otherwise, the slime can't be avoided as it drops. A creature that comes into contact with the green slime takes 5 or 1d10 acid damage. The creature takes damage again at the start of each of its turns until the slime is scraped off or destroyed. Against wood or metal, green slime deals 11 or 2d10 acid damage each round, and any non-magical wood or metal weapons tool used to scrape off the slime is effectively destroyed. Sunlight and any effect that cures disease or any effect that deals cold, fire or radiant damage destroys a part of green slime. Alright, so I think there was something similar in the Baldur's Gate games, but it was a monster. It was very firmly a monster, it could walk, albeit very slowly, and hit you, and you could fight it. Mm, so not quite like it. Then you could kill it, of course, and this one, it doesn't have HP, it doesn't have a, a stat block. So you can't kill it, but it, it can see, and it drops deliberately on, on adventurers, so... I'm not sure if this counts or no. It could be it could be just chalked down to the difference in the D&D edition. Anyway, webs. Giant spiders weave thick, sticky webs across passages and the bottoms of pits to snare prey. These web-filled areas are difficult terrain. Moreover, a creature entering a webbed area for the first time on a turn or starting its turn there must succeed at DC 12 dexterity saving throw or become restrained by the webs. A restrained creature can use its action to try and escape doing so with a successful DC 12 strength athletics or dexterity acrobatics check. Right. Each 10 foot cube of giant webs has AC 10, 15 hit points, vulnerability to fire and immunity to bludgeoning, piercing and psychic damage. So webs have hit points. I assume it's uh it's similar to doors and such, they probably also have hit points when you break them. Anyway, yellow mold. Yellow mold grows in dark places and one part covers a five foot square. If touched, the mold ejects a cloud of spores that fills ten foot cube originating from the mold. Any creature in the area must succeed a DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 11 or 2d10 poison damage and become poisoned for one minute. While poisoned in this way, the creature takes 5 or 1d10 poison damage at the start of each of its turns. The creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a successful save. Sunlight or any amount of fire damage instantly destroys one part of yellow mold. Okay, I, I'm gonna say that the, the idea, in theory, is pretty interesting, but I think brown mold is way over the top. It's too weird. The players wouldn't know what's happening if, if you put that in, in your game. Not even fantasy geeks would know what's happening unless they're specifically D&D geeks. Yellow mold is the most realistic because, well, it stands to reason a patch of mold releasing poisonous spores. I bet there's similar poisonous spores in reality. Maybe the poison doesn't act so quickly in reality, but I'd buy that. Like, yellow mold is pretty cool. Green slime. A green slime is... I don't know. If there, if there is a monster, like a gelatinous cube type monster, that's just a slime, that would be, I feel like, more of a classic. But uh, if there isn't, I'd, I'd be probably down to use the, the drop off of the ceiling kind of slime too. Wilderness. Between the dungeons and settlements of your campaign would lie meadows, forests, deserts, mountain ranges, oceans and other tracts of wilderness waiting to be traversed. Bringing wilderness areas to life can be a fun part of your game, both for you and your players. The following two approaches work particularly well. Travel montage approach. Sometimes the destination is more important than the journey. If the purpose of a wilderness trek is to get the characters to where the real adventure happens, gloss over the wilderness trek without checking for encounters along the way. Just as movies use travel montages to convey long and arduous journeys in a matter of seconds, you can use a few sentences of descriptive text to paint a picture of wilderness trek in your players' minds before moving on. Describe the journey as vividly as you like, but keep the forward momentum. You walk for several miles and encounter nothing of interest. It's okay, but far less evocative and memorative than a light rain dampens the rolling plains as you travel north. Around midday, you break for lunch using a lonely tree. There, the rogue finds a small rock that looks like a grinning face, but otherwise you encounter nothing out of the ordinary. That's, that's like a good way, I, I do it that way. I put a, a lot of emphasis on making things short that don't need to be long. 
on making things go quickly in your adventure because boy can random things make a game go much longer than it needs to and can make it boring whereas otherwise it would be interesting if the same things happened but happened more quickly so i put a lot of emphasis on making things brisk in my adventures i don't always succeed but i always try and the second description it's not too long and at the same time it's more interesting than the first one that's my jam the trick is to focus on a few details and reinforce the desired mood rather than describe everything down to the last blade of grass call attention to unusual terrain features a waterfall a rocky outcropping that offers a breathtaking view over the tops of the surrounding trees an area where the forest has burned or been cut down and so on also Describe notable smells and sounds, such as the roar of a faraway monster, the stench of burned wood, or the sweet aroma of flowers in an elven forest. In addition to evocative language, visual aids can help set the scene of the character's travels. Image searches on the internet can lead you to breathtaking landscapes. In fact, that's a good phrase to search for. Both real and fantastical. As striking as real-world scenery can be, wilderness travel can be used to remind the players that the characters are in a fantasy world. Once in a while, spice up your descriptions with some truly magical element. A forest might be home to tiny dragonets instead of birds, or its trees might be festooned with giant webs or have eerie glowing sap festooned good word. Use these elements sparingly. Landscapes that are too alien can break your player's sense of immersion in the world. A single fantastic element within an otherwise realistic and memorable landscape is enough. Use the landscapes to set the mood and tone for your adventure. In one forest, close-set trees shroud all light and seem to watch the adventurers as they pass. In another, sunlight streams through the leaves above, and flower-laden vines twine up every trunk. Signs of corruptions, rotting wood, foul-smelling water, and rocks covered with slimy brown moss can be a signal that the adventurers are drawing close to the site of evil power that is the destination, or can provide clues to the nature of the threats to be found there. Specific wilderness locations might have their own special features. For example, the spirit forest and the spider haunt woods might feature different kinds of trees, different kinds of flora and fauna, different weather and different random encounter tables. Finally, a wilderness trek can be announced by calling attention to the weather. You spend the next three days crossing the swamp. Sounds less harrowing than you spend the next three days trudging through knee-deep mud, the first two days and nights in pouring rain, and then another day under the beating sun with swarms of hungry insects feasting on your blood. Hour by hour approach. I'm not gonna like this one, I bet. Sometimes the journey deserves as much time and attention as the destination. If wilderness travel features prominently in your adventure and isn't something you want to gloss over, you will need more than a descriptive overview to bring a long and harrowing journey to life. You will need to know the party's marching order and have encounters at the ready. Let your players determine the party's marching order. See the player's handbook for more information. Characters in the front rank are likely to be the first to notice the landmarks and terrain features, as well as the ones responsible for navigating. Characters in the back rank are usually responsible for making sure that the party isn't being followed. Encourage characters in the middle ranks to do something other than blindly trudge along behind the front rank characters. The player's handbook suggests activities such as map making or foraging for food. Wilderness journeys typically feature a combination of planned encounters, encounters that you prepare ahead of time, and random encounters, encounters determined by rolling on a table. A planned encounter might need a map of the location where the encounter is set to occur, such as a ruin, a bridge spanning a gorge, or some other memorable location. Random encounters tend to be less location specific. The fewer planned encounters you have, the more you will need to rely on random encounters to keep the journey interesting. See chapter 3 for guidelines on creating random encounters. Encounter tables When when to check for random encounters, a good way to keep wilderness encounters from becoming stale is to make sure they don't start and end the same way. In other words, if the wilderness is your stage and your adventure is the play or movie, Think of each wilderness encounter as its own scene and try to stage each one in a slightly different way to keep your player's interest. If one encounter comes at the adventurers from the front, the next one might come at them from above or behind. If an encounter features stealthy monsters, a character tending to the party's pack animals might get the first indication that monsters are near when a pony wickers nervously. If an encounter features loud monsters, the party might have the option to hide or set an ambush. One group of monsters might attack the party on sight, and another might allow safe passage for food. Reward characters for searching while they travel by providing things for them to find. Broken statues, trucks, abandoned campsites and other finds that add flavor to your world. 
foreshadow future encounters or events, or provide hooks for further adventures. A wilderness journey might take multiple sessions to play out. That said, if the wilderness journey includes long periods with no encounters, use the travel montage approach to bridge gaps between encounters. Okay, so I have strong feelings about this one. Personally, I think that if you want to feature an encounter, a combat encounter or any other encounter, it could be in the wilderness, anywhere, really, as part of your story. Make it contribute something to the story, right? Percentage-wise, try to make as much of your adventure be relevant to the story as possible. Have your story happen at the rate of 15 developments a game, if you can, if you could. Obviously it's impossible, but you could strive for it. If you were able to cram a feature film's worth of plot twists and turns and combat and all that stuff into a single game, a feature film's worth of story into a single game, you should just cram it in. It means you're gonna have more game in your game. It doesn't mean that you're gonna have less things not using these encounters. Uh, you're gonna have more things the faster you do your, your plot, right? Doing your plot fast without rushing anyone, without rushing the players, without rushing anyone, just making it condensed, is a good way to have more game in your game. Think of a show that has an insanely fast pacing and try to model that in your game. I think you're gonna be happy with the results, that's what I try to do. Actually I'm modeling it more after books, after books that have very little description. Say if you were to compare a Terry Pratchett book to a John Ronald Rule Tolkien book, Terry Pratchett book is gonna have much less descriptions and Things are just gonna happen, 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 happen quickly. There's not gonna be non-plot relevant, non-funny, non-interesting things happening. The way Pratchett writes is very to the point. It's better if your happenings per minute uh, counter is high. And I don't mean combat, I mean things that are interesting, relevant. That change things in the, in the player's perception, for example. Say, you could have uh, the following de developments, and I'm try like, bear with me, I'm trying to come up with this off the cuff. Your character learns that their father is alive, then they find their father, and the villain kills their father, and they pursue them across thousands of miles, and they eventually find the villain, they kill the villain, but across this uh, harrowing journey, they are changed themselves, and they have become much more evil over the process, and at the end, after they've killed the villain, their victory feels hollow and they themselves become kind of evil and villainous. You could have that happen over the course of a campaign, but if you could have that happen over the course of, say, two games, imagine how action-packed and exciting these games would end up being. If you could do it, obviously. You probably can't do it, like, that's unrealistic, but... Uh, you can have goals. That's what I mean. That, like, I, I feel like the, the example presents it much better. And imagine a campaign that consists of all games that have this amount of action. How much would happen? It's always a problem in role-playing games that things happen slowly. And why do they happen slowly? Because we as DMs don't pay attention when making our games to design them in a way that's going to facilitate things happening quickly. And I'm guilty of that. Often, despite how I strive to design a game that's quick and, and brisk and action-packed and adventure-packed and story-packed, it devolves into a game of two hours of shopping, just cause it's, uh, it's the magic of, of RPGs. But every now and then you succeed and you make a, an awesome game. And we have to try every time. Mapping a wilderness, in contrast to a dungeon, an outdoor setting presents seemingly endless options. The adventurers can move in any direction over a trackless desert or an open grassland. So how do you, as the DM, deal with all the possible locations and events that might make up the wilderness campaign? What if you design an encounter in a desert oasis, but the characters miss the oasis because they wander off course? How do you avoid creating a boring play session of uninterrupted slogging across rocky wasteland? And that's a, that's a very real danger if you're not gonna skim over wilderness travel that doesn't have any plot developments planned for it. That's a very real danger. One solution is to think of an outdoor setting in the same way you think about a dungeon. Even the most wide open terrain presents clear pathways. Roads seldom run straight because they follow the contours of the land, finding the most level or otherwise easiest routes across uneven ground. Valleys and ridges channel travel in certain directions. Mountain ranges present forbidding barriers traversed only by remote passes. Even the most trackless deserts reveal favored routes where explorers and caravan drivers have discovered areas of wind-blasted rock that are easier to traverse than shifting sand. Desert is probably the worst one and I'm gonna be doing desert. Oof. 
with the party VS of track, you might be able to relocate one or more of your plant encounters elsewhere on the map to ensure that the time spent preparing these encounters doesn't go to waste. Chapter 1 discusses the basics of creating a wilderness map at three different scales to help you design your world and the starting area of your campaign. Especially when you get down to province scale, 1 hex equals 1 mile, think about the paths of travel, roads, passes, bridges and valleys and so on. You can guide characters' movement across your map. I like to not overdo the mapping. I like a lot of it to happen in your, in your imagination without drawings. Because, uh, like imagine you have to map a city and then you draw every house. And imagine the players decide to go house by house searching for something. It's going to be a nightmare. How are you going to come up with what's in every house and remember it? It would be impossible. Uh, it wouldn't happen, but it could happen, right? Similar things could happen. Not as bad, but similar. And generally, I think it doesn't add anything to have a precise map. Movement on the map. Narrate wilderness travel at a level of detail appropriate to the map you're using. If you're tracking hour by hour movement on a province scale map, 1 hex equals 1 mile, you can describe each hamlet the adventurers pass at this scale. You can assume that the characters find a noteworthy location when they enter its hex unless the site is specifically hidden. Oh my god, imagine tracking hour by hour movement on a province scale map where 1 hex equals 1 mile. Sounds horrible. It doesn't sound like fun gaming, let me tell you this. Uh, the characters might not walk directly up to the front door of a ruined castle when they enter a hex, but they can find old paths, outlying ruins, or other signs of its presence in the area. If you're tracking a journey of several days on a kingdom scale map, one hex equals six miles, don't bother with details too small to appear on your map. It's enough for the players to know that the third day of the journey they cross a river and the land starts rising before them and that they reach the mountain pass two days later. Wilderness features. No wilderness map is complete without a few settlements, strongholds, ruins and other sites worthy of discovery. A dozen such locations scattered over an area roughly 50 miles across is a good start. Monster layers. A wilderness area approximately 50 miles across can support roughly half a dozen monster layers with probably no more than one apex predator such as a dragon. If you expect the characters to explore a monster's lair, you will need to find or create an appropriate map for the lair and stock the lair as you would a dungeon. Monuments In places where civilization rules or once ruled, adventurers might find monuments built to honor great leaders, gods and cultures. Use the monuments table for inspiration or randomly roll to determine what monument the adventurers stumble upon. 1. Sealed burial mound or pyramid. 2. Plundered burial mound or pyramid. 3. Faces carved into a mountainside or cliff. 4. Giant statues carved out of a mountainside or cliff. 5 to 6. Intact obelisk etched with warning, historical lore, dedication, or religious iconography. 7 to 8. Ruined or toppled obelisk. 9 to 10. Intact statue of a person or deity. 11 to 13. Ruined or toppled statue of a person or deity. 14. Great stone wall, intact with tower fortifications, spaced at one mile intervals. 15. Great stone wall in ruins. 16. Great stone arc. 17. Fountain. 18. Intact circle of standing stones. 19. Ruined or toppled circle of standing stones. 20. Totem Pole. Out of Pep? I don't know. Like an old commercial. Ruins. Crumbling towers, ancient temples and raised cities are perfect sites for adventures. Additionally, noting the existence of an old crumbling wall that runs alongside a road, a sagging stone windmill on a hilltop, or a jumble of standing stones can add texture to your wilderness. Settlements. Settlements exist in places where food, water, farmland and building materials are abundant. A civilized province roughly 50 miles across might have one city, a few rural towns, and a scattering of villages and trading posts. An uncivilized area might have a single trading post that stands at the edge of a wild frontier, but no larger settlements. In addition to settlements, a province might contain ruined villages, and towns that are either abandoned or serve as lairs for marauding bandits and monsters. Strongholds Strongholds provide the local population with protection in times of trouble. The number of strongholds in an area depends on the dominant society. 
the population, the strategic importance or vulnerability of the region, and the wealth of the land. Weird locales. Weird locales make the fantastic and supernatural an intrinsic part of your wilderness adventures. Weird locales, D20, 1 to 2, dead magic zone similar to an anti-magic field. 3. Wild magic zone. Roll in the wild magic surge table in the player handbook whenever a spell is cast within the zone. 4. Boulder carved with talking faces. 5. Crystal cave that mystically answers questions. 6. Ancient tree containing a trapped spirit. 7 to 8. Battlefield where a lingering fog occasionally assumes humanoid forms. 5 to 10. Permanent portal to another plane of existence. 11. Wishing well. 12. Giant crystal shard protruding from the ground. 13. Wrecked ship which might be nowhere near water. 14 to 15. Haunted hill or barrow mound. 16. River Ferry guided by a skeletal captain. 17. Field of petrified soldiers or other creatures. 18. Forest of petrified or awakened trees. 19. Canyon containing a dragon's graveyard. 20. Floating earth moat with a tower on it. I don't like floating mountains. Like, I really don't. Floating mountains is what you get when, when you get a lazy artist who can't figure out his composition. That's when you get floating mountains. That's my personal opinion. Not that I'm not a lazy artist myself and that I can't uh, figure out my compositions every now and then, or rather every... Anyway, there's also an interesting one that I wanted to say something about. The one with the fog. Battlefield, where a lingering fog occasionally assumes humanoid forms. There is an actual weather phenomenon that can be observed in the mountains where the wanderer walks up an elevation just above the level of fog, right? And he has fog in front of him and light behind him and his shadow is cast on top of the fog and it looks like a specter standing in front of you, like a distinctly humanoid specter standing in front of you. It's very creepy and it can happen in reality in the mountains if you hike and the weather is just right. An idea just struck me. If I had a player roll a survival check and roll a natural one or something of that sort, or a perception check and they rolled a natural one and they were in the mountains, I'd be tempted to to trip up the party by giving them a false information like that, that they see a, a spectre in the fog, right? When in reality there is no spectre, it's just a shadow cast on the fog. I don't know. I might have to have some explaining to do after the game if they eventually find out and they could be angry but what i would never believe in that but it's, a, it's an idea wilderness survival adventuring in the wilderness presents a host of perils beyond the threats of monstrous predators and savage raiders weather you can pick weather to fit the campaign or roll on the weather table to determine the weather for a given day adjusting for the terrain and season as appropriate Weather D20, 1 to 14, normal for the season. 15 to 17, 1 to 4 times 10 degrees Fahrenheit, colder than normal. 18 to 20, 1 to 4 times 10 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than normal. D20, wind, 1 to 12, none. 13 to 17, light. 18 to 20, strong. D20, precipitation, 1 to 12, none. 13 to 17, light rain or light snowfall. 18 to 20, heavy rain or heavy snowfall. Extreme cold. Whenever the temperature is at or below 0 degrees Fahrenheit, a creature exposed to the cold must succeed on DC 10 constitution saving throw at the end of each hour or gain one level of exhaustion. Creatures with resistance or immunity to cold damage automatically succeed on the saving throw, as do creatures wearing cold weather gear, thick coats, gloves and the like, and creatures naturally adapted to cold climates. Extreme Heat When the temperature is a at or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, a creature exposed to the heat and without access to drinkable water must succeed on a constitution saving throw at the end of each hour or gain one level of exhaustion. The DC is 5 for the first hour and increases by 1 for each additional hour. Creatures wearing medium or heavy armor who are clad in heavy clothing have disadvantage on the saving throw. Creatures with resistance or immunity to fire damage automatically succeed on the saving throw as the creature is naturally adapted to hot climates. Now, strong wind. A strong wind imposes disadvantage on ranged weapon attack rolls and wisdom perception checks that rely on hearing. A strong wind also extinguishes open flames, disperses fog, and makes flying by non-magical means nearly impossible. A flying creature in a strong wind must land at the end of its turn or fall. A strong wind in the desert can create a sandstorm that imposes disadvantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. 
Heavy precipitation, everything within an area of heavy rain or heavy snowfall is lightly obscured and creatures in the area have disadvantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. Heavy rain also extinguishes open flames and imposes disadvantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on hearing. High altitude. Traveling at altitudes of 10,000 feet or higher above sea level is taxing for a creature that needs to breathe because of the reduced amount of oxygen in the air. Each hour such a creature spends traveling at high altitude counts as two hours for the purpose of determining how long that creature can travel. Breathing creatures can become acclimated to a high altitude by spending 30 days or more at this elevation. Breathing creatures can't become acclimated to elevations above 20,000 feet unless they are native to such environments. Wilderness Hazards This section describes a few examples of hazards that adventurers might encounter in the wilderness. Some hazards, such as slippery ice and raso vine, require no ability check to spot. Others, such as defiled ground, are undetectable by normal senses. What is defiled ground? That piqued my interest. Uh, the other hazards presented here can be identified with a successful intelligence nature check. Use the guidelines in Chapter 8 to set an appropriate DC for any check made to spot or recognize a hazard. Desecrated ground. Some cemeteries and catacombs are imbued with the unseen traces of ancient evil. An area of desecrated ground can be any size, and a detect evil and good spell cast within range reveals its presence. Undead standing on desecrated ground have advantage in all saving throws. A vial of holy water purifies ten foot square area of desecrated ground when sprinkled on it, and a hallow spell purifies desecrated ground within its area. Frigid water. A creature can be immersed in frigid water for a number of minutes equal to its constitution score before suffering any ill effects. Each additional minute spent in frigid water requires the creature to succeed on a DC-10 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. Creatures with resistance or immunity to cold damage automatically succeed on the saving throw, as do creatures that are naturally adapted to living in ice-cold water. Okay, these are much more interesting than the mold and the slime and the stuff in the, in the dungeon hazards. Making an adventure that uh, presented these as very important threats to the party could be cool, but I guess it would only work for a low-level party that can't do cheat spells and super powerful things. Quicksand. A quicksand pit covers the ground in roughly 10 foot square area and is usually 10 feet deep. When a creature enters the area, it sinks 1d4 plus 1 feet into the quicksand and becomes restrained. At the start of the creature's turns, it sinks another 1d4 feet. As long as the creature isn't completely submerged in quicksand, it can escape by using its action and succeeding on a strength check. The DC is 10 plus the number of feet the creature has sunk into the quicksand. A creature that is completely submerged in quicksand can't breathe. See? Suffocation rules in player's handbook. A creature can pull another creature within its reach out of quicksand pit by using its action and succeeding on a strength check. The DC is 5 plus the number of feet target creature has sunk into the quicksand. Razavine. Razavine is a plant that grows in wild tangles and hedges. It also clings to the sides of buildings and other surfaces as ivy does. A 10 foot high, 10 foot wide, 5 foot thick wall or hedge of Razavine has AC 11, 25 hit points and immunity to bludgeoning, piercing and psychic damage. When a creature comes into direct contact with Razavine for the first time on the turn, the creature must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or take 5 or 1d10 slashing damage from the Razavine's blade-like thorns. Slippery Ice Slippery Ice is difficult terrain. When a creature moves onto Slippery Ice for the first time on a turn, it must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity acrobatics check or fall prone. Thin ice has a weight tolerance of 3d10 times 10 per 10 foot square area. Whenever the total weight on an area of thin ice exceeds its tolerance, the ice in that area breaks. All creatures on broken ice fall through. Foraging. Characters can gather food and water as the party travels at a normal or slow pace. A foraging character makes a wisdom survival check whenever you call for it with the DC determined by the abundance of food and water in the region. Foraging DCs Food and water availability Abundant food and water sources DC 10 Limited food and water sources DC 15 
very little, if any, food and water sources. DC 20. If multiple characters forage, each character makes a separate check. A foraging character finds nothing on a failed check. On a successful check, roll 1d6 plus the character's wisdom modifier to determine how much food in pounds the character finds. Then repeat the roll for water in gallons. Food and water. The food and water requirements noted in the player's handbook are for characters. Horses and other creatures require different quantities of food and water per day, based on their size. Water needs are doubled if the weather is hot. Food and water needs. Creature size tiny. Food per day, one fourth pound. Water per day, one fourth gallon. Okay, let's not read that. We don't need to know exactly how much water and food a creature requires based on its size. But I have I have strong feelings about these sort of mechanics too. I'm going to run a campaign that's, that's going to happen in the desert. And obviously water is important in the desert. And in a desert country too. But water is probably very expensive. So I guess that having water to drink is going to be important for my story. But even so, I am very hesitant to make the players track their water and food and that sort of thing. And introduce these kind of mechanics. Because they're not fun to, to track. It's just not a fun mechanic to run, similar to inventory mechanics, encumbrance, uh, that sort of thing. A GM I know, a GM I play with, has decided that he wants to have a more realistic, more grounded inventory system where players can't carry three plate armors if they're just strong. And he, uh, he introduced a rather complex way of tracking how much everyone can carry. And we haven't used it even once, because we have some inexperienced players that have trouble still remembering how many attacks they have per turn and any more obscure game mechanics from the stock books elude them completely still because they're new to the game that's understandable right and we you can forget they're gonna track their inventory in an additional complex way and even if they were up to it it's not very fun. Imagine your Sunday afternoon, you have some free time on your Sunday afternoon. Yesterday you've played Dungeons and Dragons with your friends, and during the game you didn't have time to make sure that everything in your inventory is alright, you didn't pick up too much, you don't have like a two-year-old vial of troll's blood or a severed head you collected a year ago during the same campaign, right? And how do you want to spend that Sunday evening? Do you want to spend that Sunday evening by making sure that uh, everything in your inventory abides by the rules of encumbrance? No, obviously, probably no, because it's not fun. It's just not fun to do, and it's equally not fun to do during your game. And it's going to slow down your game for everyone, even if just one character is balancing their inventory. So, despite me understanding the need for having realistic inventory, and feeling that games that are more grounded in reality, that don't have characters packing everything that's not nailed down to the floor into the packs and taking it because they just might use it. That games without the sort of shenanigans are cooler, more real games are cooler, I would still not introduce an additional mechanic to track to track inventory. And I would not probably go out of my way to enforce very strongly that players don't carry too much because it's just not fun to do. And the same thing applies to scavenging for food and water a lot of the time because most of the time there isn't a way, a good way, to play it up in a dramatic way when, when the party is lacking water and food. And what you get for for the time you invest, everyone invests, and everyone at the table invests, is very little. So even despite the fact that I'm going to run a campaign in the desert, I'm still not sure if I want to track that at all. And if I do, I don't know how I'll do it to make it not annoying. Becoming lost. Unless they are following a path or something like it, adventurers traveling in the wilderness run the risk of becoming lost. The party's navigator makes a wisdom survival check when you decide it's appropriate against the DC determined by the prevailing terrain, as shown on the wilderness navigation table. If the party is moving at a slow pace, the navigator gains plus 5 bonus to the check, and a fast pace imposes a minus 5 penalty. If the party has an accurate map of the region, or can see the sun or stars, the navigator has advantage on the check. If the wisdom survival check succeeds, the party travels into the desired direction without becoming lost. If the check fails, the party inadvertently travels in the wrong direction and becomes lost. The party's navigator can repeat the check after the party spends 1 to 6 hours trying to get back on the course. Wilderness navigation, terrain DC. Jungle, forest, swamp, mountains or open sea with overcast skies and no land in sight. DC 15. Arctic desert, hills or open sea with clear skies and no land in sight. DC 10. Grassland, meadow, farmland.
DC5. Settlements. A village, town or city makes an excellent backdrop for an adventure. The adventurers might be called on to track down a criminal who's gone into hiding, solve a murder, take out a gang of were rats or doppelgangers, or protect the settlement under siege. When creating a settlement for your campaign, focus on the locations that are most relevant to the adventure. Don't worry about naming every street and identifying the inhabitants of every building. That way lies madness. That's a good comment. I wasn't expecting it that sentence. Random settlements. The following tables allow you to quickly create a settlement. They assume you have already determined its size and its basic form of government. Race relations. D20. 1 to 10 harmony. 11 to 14. Tensions or rivalry. 15 to 16. Racial majority are conquerors. 17. Racial minority are rulers. 18. Racial minority are refugees. 19. Racial majority oppresses minority. 20. Racial minority oppresses majority. Rulers. Status D20. 1 to 5. Respected, fair and just. 6 to 8. Feared tyrant. 9. Weakling manipulated by others. 10. Illegitimate ruler simmering civil war. 11. Ruled or controlled by a powerful monster. 12. Mysterious, anonymous cabal. 13. Contested leadership, open fighting. 14. Cabal seized power openly. Cabal is a good word, by the way. 15. Doltish lout. 16. On deathbed, claimants compete for power. 17 to 18. I unwilled but respected. 19 to 20. Religious leader. Noble traits. D20. 1. Canals in place of streets. 2. Massive statue or monument. 3. Grand temple. 4. Large fortress. 5. Verdant parks and orchards. 6. River divides town. 7. Major trade center. 8. Headquarters of a powerful family or guild. 9. Population mostly wealthy. 10. Destitute rundown. 11. Awful smell. Tanneries, open sewers. 12. Center of trade for one specific good. 13. Site of many battles. 14. Site of a mythic or magical event. 15. Important library or archive. 16. Worship of all gods banned. All gods banned? That's pretty hardcore for a fantasy setting. 17. Sinister reputation. 18. Notable library or academy. Actually, that's pretty hardcore not only for a fantasy setting. It would be pretty hardcore in, in reality. 19. Site of important tomb or graveyard. 20. Built atop ancient ruins. Known for its D20. 1. Delicious cuisine. 2. Rude people. 3. Greedy merchants. 4. Artists and writers. 5. Great hero savior. 6. Flowers. 7. Hordes of beggars. 8. Tough warriors. 9. Dark magic. 10. Decadence. 11. Piety. 12. Gambling. 13. Godliness. 14. Education. 15. Wines. 16. High fashion. 17. Political intrigue. 18. Powerful guilds. 19. Strong drink. 20. Patriotism. Current Calamity. Okay, so we have a Calamity. 1. Suspected Vampire Infestation. 2. New Cult Seeks Converts. 3. Important Figure Died. Murder Suspected. 4. War Between Rival Thieves Guilds. 5. to 6. Plague or Famine. Barks Riots. 7. Corrupt Officials. 8. to 9. Marauding Monsters. 10. Powerful Wizard Has Moved Into Town. 11. Economic Depression. Trade Disrupted. 12. Flooding. 13. Undead Stirring in Cemeteries. 14. Prophecy of Doom. 15. Brink of War. 16. Internal Strife. Leads to Anarchy. 17. Besieged by Enemies. 18. Scandal Threatens Powerful Families. 19. Dungeon Discovered. Adventurers Flock to Town. 20. Religious Sects Struggle for Power. Plague or Famine. That one sparks riots or like disturbs something. Doesn't have to be a, a zombie plague to, to make for an interesting game. Even just a, a regular plague in a, in a merchant town could cause unrest and have the merchants want to reopen stalls but the government for example says no and has to send guards to bash people in their faces that sort of thing interesting isn't it it might not go down well with some players given that it, uh, it could be taken as insensitive and i understand but i guess the best games do draw from reality best stories in general draw something from reality random buildings Fast pounding chases and hurrying escapes within the confines of a town or city can sometimes force characters to dash into buildings. When you need to flesh out the building quickly, roll on the building type table. Then roll on the table corresponding to that building to add further detail. That does not sound quick. If a roll makes no sense considering where the characters are, 
such as a lavish mansion in a rundown part of town, you can always roll again or simply choose another result. However, such unexpected results can prompt creativity and memorable locations can help make your urban encounters distinct. <laughs> I can't imagine a character chasing another character through the slums and they burst through a window and they suddenly find themselves in a gorgeous villa with golden statues. It wouldn't happen normally. Unless it's like the, the one house of the crime kingpin who rules the, the entire slums with an iron fist and it's all stolen stuff from the nobles. That could be an adventure hook in and of itself. I guess they're kind of right with such unexpected results being often memorable locations. Building type. D20, 1-10, to 10, residence, roll once on the residence table. 11-12, to 12, religious, roll once on the religious building table. 13-15, to 15, tavern, roll once on the tavern table and twice on the tavern name generator table. 16-17, to 17, warehouse, roll once on the warehouse table. 18-20, to 20, shop, roll once on the shop table. Residence, D20, 1-10, to 10, abandoned squat. 3-8, to 8, middle class home. 9-10, to 10, upper class home. 11 to 15 crowded tenement, 16 to 17 orphanage, 18 hidden slavers den, 19 front for secret cult, 20 lavish guarded mansion. Did you guys know that in the middle ages and renaissance and through a lot of human history orphanages did not exist? First orphanage I think is 18th century, that's pretty late, but considering how brutal, how absolutely brutal the world used to be, I'm not that surprised. So I guess that's a bit off-brand for the medieval fantasy setting. It's not off-brand for the fantasy setting as such. But I guess it wouldn't be too extraordinary to imagine that in the past ages, religious organizations, temples, monasteries, nunneries, these sorts of things would sometimes take in a child or two, even if they weren't strictly an orphanage. I bet that sort of thing happened a lot. Okay, okay, okay. Religious building. Want to turn temple to a good or neutral deity. 11 to 12, temple, temple to a false deity run by charlatan priests. 13, home of ascetics. 14 to 15, abandoned shrine. 16 to 17, library dedicated to religious study. 18 to 20, hidden shrine to a fiend or an evil deity. Tavern. 1 to 5, quiet low-key bar. 6 to 9, raucous dive. 10, thieves guild hangout. 11, gathering place for a secret society. 12 to 13, upper class dining club. 14 to 15, gambling den. 16 to 17, caters to a specific race or guild. 18, members only club. 19 to 20, brothel. Tavern name generator, D20, 1. The silver, second, okay, it's like a, you roll on one of two parts, so you can get, for example, the silver eel, the golden dolphin, the staggering dwarf, the laughing pegasus, the prancing pony, oh my god, that's a, that's a Tolkien tavern name. The gilded rose, the running stag, the howling wolf, the slaughtered lamb, the leering demon, the drunken goat, the leaping spirit, the roaring horde, the frowning jester, the lonely mountain, that's another Tolkien name but not a tavern, the wandering eagle, the mysterious satyr, the barking dog, the black spider, the gleaming star. I wouldn't want to stop at the tavern that's called the black spider necessarily, and you can get any combination of those. What's the most ridiculous one we can think about? The staggering eel, for example, would be pretty funny. I could see a, uh, an end called the drunken eel. There is this joke in Polish that can't be translated about a fish and drinking. Too bad you, you can't translate it. Warehouse type. 1 to 4, empty or abandoned. 5 to 6, heavily guarded, expensive goods. 7 to 10, cheap goods. 11 to 14, bulk goods. 15, live animals. 16 to 17, weapons, armor. 18 to 19 goods from distant land, 20 secret smugglers down. Shop D21, pawn shop 2, herbs, incense, 3 fruits, vegetables, 4 dried meats, 5 pottery, 6 undertaker, 7 books, 8 moneylender, 9 weapons, armor, 10 chandler. What's a chandler? I actually don't know. Anyway, 11 smithy, 12 carpenter, 13 weaver, 14 jeweler, 15 baker, 16 map maker. 17 tailor, 18 robe maker, 19 mason, 20 scribe. Mapping a settlement. When you draw a map for a settlement in your game, don't worry about the placement of every building and concentrate instead on the major features. For a village, sketch out the roads, including trade routes, leading beyond the village and roads to connect the village center. 
If the adventurers visit specific places in the village, mark those spots on your map for towns and cities, note major roads and waterways, as well as surrounding terrain. Outline the walls and mark the locations of features you know will be important. The Lord's Keep, significant temples and the like. For cities, add internal walls and think about the personality of each ward. Give the wards names reflecting their personalities, which also identify the kinds of trades that dominate the neighborhood. Tannery Square, Temple Row, a geographical characteristic hilltop riverside or a dominant site, the Lord's Quarter. Urban Encounters Although they hold the promise of safety, cities and towns can be just as dangerous as the darkest dungeon. Evil hides in plain sight or in dark corners. Sewers, shadowy alleys, slums, smoke-filled taverns, dilapidated tenements and crowded marketplaces can quickly turn into battlegrounds. On top of that, adventurers must learn to behave themselves, lest they attract unwanted attention from local authorities. That said, characters who don't go looking for trouble can take advantage of all the benefits that the settlement has to offer. Law and Order Whether a settlement has a police force depends on its size and nature. A lawful, orderly city might have a city watch to maintain order and a trained militia to defend its walls, and a frontier town might rely on venturers or its citizenry to apprehend criminals and fend off attackers. Trials In most settlements, trials are overseen by magistrates or local lords. Some trials are argued with the conflicting parties of the advocates presenting precedent and evidence until the judge makes a decision with or without the aid of spells or interrogation. Others are decided with trial by ordeal or trial by combat. If the evidence against the accused is overwhelming, a magistrate or a local lord can forego trial and skip right to the sentencing. Sentences. A settlement might have a jail to hold accused criminals awaiting trial but few settlements have prisons to incarcerate convicted criminals. A person found guilty of a crime is usually fined, condemned to forced labor, for a period of several months or years, exiled or executed depending on the magnitude of the crime. Stop right there, you have violated the law. I don't know the rest of the line unfortunately because I'm not a Skyrim fan, I'm not a true gamer, but it wouldn't probably go down like in Skyrim. You, you wouldn't just get off with a fine and having your goods confiscated. The stolen goods are now forfeit, now pay the fine and... How did it go? I don't know, I don't remember. Uh, anyway. In a fantasy setting, I think that having a trial with lawyers and sides arguing and an actual impartial judge, that's a far stretch. It's like a super far stretch. A trial by ordeal or trial by combat is much more interesting and I think much more on brand for fantasy. For medieval fantasy at least. Random Urban Encounters. The Random Urban Encounters table is useful for city and town based adventures. Check for a random encounter at least once per day and once at night if the characters are out and about. Roll the result if it doesn't make sense given the time of day. 1d12 plus d8. 2. Animals on the loose. 3. Announcements. 4. Brawl. 5. Bullies. 6. Companion. 7. Contest. 8. Corpse. 9. Draft. 10. Drunk. 11 fire, 12 found trinket, 13 guard harassment, 14 pickpocket, 15 procession, 16 protest, 17 runaway cart, 18 shady transaction, 19 spectacle, 20 urchin. I actually, I actually had an urban encounter today and a good one. I found a trinket. I found a credit card on the street today and I guess I did the right thing because I called, I called the bank and I said I found this card belonging to this and that person. Could you, uh... Could you block it? And they blocked it and I just cut the card with a, a scissors and threw it in the trash. Hopefully the person's not going to have any trouble because they, they wouldn't. And I thought about giving it back but the bank doesn't really do that sort of thing. They just, uh, they just block it and I guess that's fair. Animals on the loose. The characters see one or more unexpected animals in the street. This challenge could be anything from a pack of baboons to an escaped circus bear, tiger or elephant. Announcement. A herald, town crier, mad person or other individual makes an announcement on a street corner for all to hear. The announcement might foreshadow some upcoming events such as public execution, communicate important information to general masters such as a new royal decree, or convey a dire omen or warning. Brawl. A brawl erupts near the adventurers. It could be a tavern brawl, a battle between rival faction families or gangs in the city, or a struggle between the city guards and criminals. The characters could be witnesses hit by a stray arrow or mistaken for members of one group and attacked by the other. Bullies. The characters witness 1d4 plus 2 bullies harassing an out-of-towner. 
Use the common statistics in the monster manual for all of them. A bully flees as soon as he or she takes any amount of damage. That's a pretty common cliche in fantasy, especially for introducing a follower or a friendly character. I guess that makes us feel sorry for the, for the bullied person. Players don't usually join the bullies and kick the person, but it could happen, depending on the party. Companion. One or more characters are approached by a local who takes a friendly interest in the party's activities. As a twist, the would-be companion might be a spy sent to gather information on the adventurers. Contest. The adventurers are drawn into an impromptu contest, anything from an intellectual test to a drinking competition, or witness a duel. Corpse. The adventurers find a humanoid corpse. Draft. The adventurers are drafted by members of the City Watch who need their help to deal with an immediate problem. As a twist, the member of the Watch might be a disguised criminal trying to lure the party into an ambush. Use the thug statistics in the monster manual for the criminal and his or her cohorts. Drunk. A tipsy drunk staggers towards a random party member, mistaking him or her for something else. Fire. A fire breaks out and the characters have a chance to help put out the flames before it spreads. Found trinket. The characters find a random trinket. You can determine the trinket by rolling on the trinkets table in the player's handbook. Oh, those are really useless. I remember that table. Guard harassment. The adventurers are cornered by 1d4 plus 1 guards eager to throw their weight around. If threatened, the guards call out for help and might attract the attention of other guards or citizens nearby. Pickpocket. A thief. Use the spy statistics in the monster manual. Tries to steal from a random character. Characters whose passive wisdom perception scores are equal to or greater than the thief's dexterity. Slate of hand. Check total. Catch the thief in progress. Procession. The adventurers encounter a group of citizens either parading in celebration or forming a funeral procession. Protest. The adventurers see a group of citizens peacefully protesting a new law or decree. A handful of guards maintain order. Runaway cars, a team of horses pulling a wagon, races through the city streets. The adventurers must avoid the horses. If they stop the wagon, the owner, who is running behind the cart, is grateful. Shady transaction. The characters witness a shady transaction between two cloaked figures. Spectacle. The characters witness a form of public entertainment, such as a talented bard's impersonation. Overall personage. Street circus, a puppet show, a flashy magic act, a royal visit, or a public execution. It's quite a spectacle, but it's very medieval, I have to say. Urchin. A street urchin gloms into the adventurers and follows them around until frightened off. What does glom mean? Sounds like a good word, but I, I don't know it, so I'm not gonna say good word. Unusual environments. Traveling through the wilderness doesn't always mean an overland trek. Adventurers might ply the open sea in a caravel or an elemental powered galleon, soar through the air on hippogriffs or a carpet of flying or ride giant seahorses to coral palaces beneath the sea. Underwater See Chapter 9 of the Player's Handbook for rules on underwater combat. Random Undersea Encounters You can check for random undersea encounters as often as you would check for them on land. See Chapter 3. The random undersea encounter table presents several intriguing options. You can either roll on the table for a random result or choose whichever one works best. Random Undersea Encounters 1d12 plus d8, 2. Sunken ship covered in barnacles, 25% chance that the ship contains treasure. Roll randomly on the treasure tables in chapter 7. 3. Sunken ship with reef sharks, shallow waters, or hunter sharks, deep waters, circling around it. 50% chance that the ship contains treasure. Roll randomly on the treasure tables in chapter 7. Bed of giant oysters, each oyster has a 1% chance of having a giant 5,000 gold P pearl inside. 5. Underwater sea vent. 25% chance that the vent is a portal to the elemental plane of fire. 6. Sunken ruin. Uninhabited. 7. Sunken ruin. Inhabited or haunted. 8. Sunken statue or monolith. 9. Friendly and curious giant seahorse. 10. Patrol of friendly merfolk. 11. Patrol of Hostile Marrow, Coastal Waters, or Sahuagin, Deep Waters. 12. Enormous Kelp Bed, roll again on the table to determine what's hidden in the Kelp Bed. 13. Undersea Cave, Empty. 14. Undersea Cave, Sea Hag Lair. 15. Undersea Cave, Merfolk Lair. 16. Undersea Cave, Giant Octopus Lair. 17. Undersea Cave, Dragon Turtle Lair. 
18. Bronze Dragon searching for treasure. 19. Storm Giant walking on the ocean floor. 20. Sunken treasure chest. 25% chance that it contains something of value. Roll treasure randomly using the tables in chapter 7. So I wonder about the uh, bit where it says that you can find a... Uh, what kind of event? A uh, steam vent? Yeah, a steam vent that is perhaps a portal to the elemental plane of fire. Would the players die from heat before entering the the plane of fire if they didn't use um fire protection gear? Well, how would it even work? Or is it just a hole through, through a plane? I guess I'd probably make them take damage. I wouldn't necessarily have them die. There's probably rules for, for damage from boiling water, isn't there? I bet there is. If not in this edition, there, there probably used to be something. Because the old editions, they had the most ridiculous tables. Anyway, swimming. Unless aided by magic, a character can't swim for full 8 hours per day. After each hour of swimming, a character must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. A creature that has swimming speed, including a character with a ring of swimming or similar magic, can swim all day without penalty and uses the normal forced march rules in player's handbook. Swimming through deep water is similar to traveling at high altitudes. Because of the water's pressure and cold temperature, for a creature without a swimming speed, each hour spent swimming at a depth greater than 100 feet counts as two hours for the purpose of determining exhaustion. Swimming for an hour at depth greater than 200 feet counts as four hours, so it's pretty exhausting. I, I wouldn't remember all of that, but just remember that it's pretty exhausting and if you want to run a campaign that's underwater, you can always come back to this part. Underwater visibility. Visibility underwater depends on water clarity and the available light. Unless the characters have light sources, use the underwater encounter distance table to determine the distance at which characters underwater become aware of a possible encounter. Underwater encounter distance. Creature size. Encounter distance. Clear water, bright light, 60 feet. So you can see 60 feet in, in clear water. Clear water, dim light, you can see 30 feet. And murky water, or no light, you can see 10 feet. Or probably not even see, but sense somehow. You can hear underwater. I heard that underwater sound actually travels for a, for a much longer distance. But hearing is kind of weird when you're underwater. It doesn't feel like underwater you hear better necessarily. But I've heard the sound carries more. I don't know. I'd have to test it. Cactus can row a boat for 8 hours per day or can row longer at the risk of exhaustion as per the rules for a forced march in chapter 8 of the player's handbook. A fully crewed sailing vessel can sail all day assuming its sailors work in shifts. Navigation. Seagoing vessels stay close to a shore where they can because navigation is easier when landmarks are visible. As long as a ship is within sight of land, there is no chance of a vessel becoming lost. Otherwise, the ship's navigator must rely on dead reckoning, tracking the differences and distance of the ship's travel, or the sun and the stars. I had an idea for a tangent. Okay, so a campaign where characters own a boat and they have to row everywhere on a, say, small archipelago would be interesting. But not like a big ship where they have their own crew to do everything for them, but a small boat where every player has to do something and they have to do it personally or maybe they all row because it takes four people to row it they could argue over it and get exhaustion levels like the book says that'd be interesting could be interesting i like these sort of deals or even if you if you have a land campaign where they have a a cart they have a cart they own and all of their earthly belongings are in the cart and they treat it like a house that moves. Random encounters at sea. You can check for random encounters at sea as often as you would check for them on land. See chapter 3 for more information. The random encounters at sea table presents a number of options and ideas. Shipwrecks. A shipwreck is a plot device that can be used sparingly to great effect, particularly if you want the characters to be washed ashore on some monster infested island or in the case of an airship dropped in the middle of some exotic land. There aren't rules for determining when a shipwreck happens. It happens when you want or need it to happen. Even the strongest seafaring ship can founder in a storm, run aground on rocks or reefs, sink during a pirate attack, or be dragged underwater by a sea monster. Sorry, A storm or hungry dragon can lay waste to an airship just as easily. A shipwreck has the potential to change the direction of a campaign. It isn't, however a particularly good way to kill off characters or end the campaign. 
If you and your companion conspire to wreck a ship on which the characters are traveling, it is assumed that the characters survive with the equipment they are wearing or carrying still in their possession. The fate of any NPCs and cargo aboard the wrecked ship is entirely up to you. I guess that if I wanted to wreck a ship, I'd still give the players a chance. I'd make a very hard DC and make a... what's it called? Can you make like, like a team contested skill check? Or maybe not contested, but... Because the storm isn't the person to contest it, but... Uh, the storm would represent the difficulty and the players would have to do to make a... Like you do with stealth, when the party is stealthing. And you have to rule, I think... A success on average, right? I'd probably have them roll everybody who's manning the ship, who's a part of the crew and doing something important for the ship's functioning. I'd have them roll and give them a chance, give them a fighting chance to not to not wreck the ship. I think that's fair, mind you. If you want the the ship to crash, you can just make the DC thirty, and they had their chance, like with with all natural twenties. I'm sure they they would have, but you know. Random encounters at sea. D12 plus C8. 2. Ghost ship. 3. Friendly and curious bronze dragon. 4. Whirlpool. 25% chance that the whirlpool is a portal to the elemental plane of water. 3. Merfolk traders. 6. Passing warship friendly or hostile. 7 to 8. Pirate ship. Hostile. 9 to 10. Passing merchant ship. Galley or sailing ship. 11 to 12 killer whale sighting, 13 to 14 floating debris, 15 longship crewed by hostile berserkers, 16 hostile griffins or harpies, 17 iceberg easily avoided if seen from a distance, 18 sahuagin boarding party, 19 npc in the water clinging to floating debris, 20 sea monster such as the dragon turtle or a kraken, weather at sea. Use the weather table earlier in this chapter when checking for weather at sea. If weather conditions indicate both a strong wind and heavy rain, they combine to create a storm with high waves. A crew caught in a storm loses sight of all landmarks unless they are a lighthouse or other bright feature, and the ability checks made to navigate during the storm have disadvantage. Airborne and waterborne vehicles. Oh, that's the cost of them. An airship costs 20,000 GP, a galley costs 30,000 GP, a keelboat costs 3,000 GP, a longship costs 10,000 GP, a rowboat costs only 50 GP, that's affordable. Sailing ship costs 10,000 GP, and a warship costs 25 GP. I'm not gonna read the speeds, because I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna forget them instantly. I guess if you want to run a campaign on, on sea, you might want to get back to this table. Anyway, in a dead calm, no wind, ships can't move under sail and must be rowed. A ship sailing against a strong wind moves at half speed. Visibility. A relatively calm sea offers great visibility. From a crow's nest, a lookout can spot another ship or a coastline up to 10 miles away, assuming clear skies. Overcast skies reduce the distance by half. Rain and fog reduce visibility just as they do on land. I actually don't recall how how reduced visibility from rain and, and fog works in this game. I'm sure it's somewhere. I might have read through it already, but I just didn't remember. Could be player's handbook. Anyway, owning a ship, at some point in your campaign, the adventurers might gain custody of a ship. They might purchase or capture one, or receive one to carry out a mission. It's up to you whether a ship is available for purchase and you have the power to deprive the adventurers of a ship at any time should it become a nuisance. See shipwreck sidebar. Should it become a nuisance? That's uh, oddly. That's suspicious. I'm just gonna say it's suspicious. Does the book mean that they, uh, they suddenly start bypassing all the carefully crafted locations you've prepared for them to visit and they just swim around or fly above it? God forbid if they have an airship. In the MMO communities, uh, in, in particular World of Warcraft, people were kind of split on whether or not flying mounts are a good thing, because the vanilla world that didn't have flying mounts, people had to walk the land all across the continent and they get to experience the world in a, in a unique way. They got to get a very personal view of every place before, before they left it behind, even if they didn't want to quest there. And there's something to be said for it, like it's very cool. And when flying mounts appeared, this 
aspect of the game went poof, it was gone. A lot of the world didn't matter suddenly and some people, after a time, because it was a luxury at first it felt like a drug, but after a time some people felt this took away something important from the game. The same could happen for a tabletop game I suppose, if you had a flying ship. Incidentally, I'm with the people who say that flying mounts and MMOs are not that great, but they take something away from the world. Yeah, they strongly suggest that you can just make a ship go poof if you as the DM feel like it should go poof. It's kind of unfair. I, I try to do it in a tricksy way where they still have a chance theoretically to keep it, but sometimes they have to. Crew. A ship needs a crew of skilled hirelings to function. As per the player's handbook, one skilled hireling costs at least 2 GP per day. The minimum number of skilled hirelings needed to crew a ship depends on the type of vessel, as shown in the airborne and waterborne vehicle stable. I recommend giving players mounts for carrying treasure versus flying mounts. I'd never give them flying mounts personally. I don't think I'd, I ever would. I like down to earth bits of adventuring to make travel feel like real life hiking a bit, or to be described the way real life hiking is so that it has a... It has something familiar to it, so that the campaign has more familiar things to it. I like the feeling of a low-tech world that at some point, and in some places still exists, I'd like fantasy to, to call back to that. And I feel like if everybody's flying on a griffin and wielding a magic wand that could do everything, it doesn't have that anymore. I had a campaign where they had a train of elephants, that sounds interesting. We just wouldn't leave any treasure behind and DM wouldn't give us anything to carry it easier. Were the elephants part of the story? Because when, when I read your first message I, I thought, oh, so it was like a, like a Hannibal taking elephants across the mountains, that sort of deal, and the, the elephants were a part of the story. Or did you just buy them because they felt like a cool thing and an easy way to, to carry around a bunch of loot? Fan characters can move from one place to another in a relatively straight line, ignoring terrain and monsters that can't fly or lock ranged attacks. Flying by spell or magic item works the same as travel on foot, as described in the player's handbook. A creature that serves as a flying mount must rest one hour for every three hours that it flies, and it can't fly for more than nine hours per day. Thus, characters mounted on griffins, which have a fly speed of 80 feet, can travel at 8 miles per hour, covering 72 miles over 9 hours with two one hour long rests over the course of the day. Mounts that don't tire, such as a flying construct, aren't subject to this limitation. As adventurers travel through the air, check the random encounters as you normally would, ignore any result that indicates a non-flying monster, and let the characters are flying close enough to the ground to be targeted by non-flying creatures making ranged attacks. Characters have normal chances to spot creatures on the ground and can decide whether to engage them. Traps Traps can be found almost anywhere. One wrong step in an ancient tomb might trigger a series of scything blades which cleave through armor and bone. The seemingly innocuous vines that hang over a cave entrance might grasp and choke anyone who pushes through them. A net hidden among the trees might drop on travelers who pass underneath. If the D&D unwary travelers can fall on their deaths, be burned alive or fall under a fusillade of poisoned darts or fusillade, I'm not sure how to read that one, it's a good word though, good word. A trap can be either mechanical or magical in nature. Mechanical traps include pits, arrow traps, falling blocks, water-filled rooms, whirling blades and anything else that depends on the mechanism to operate. Magic traps are either magical device traps or spell traps. Magical device traps initiate spell effects when activated. Spell traps are spells such as Glyph of Warding and Symbol function as traps. When adventurers come across a trap, you need to know how the trap is triggered and what it does, as well as the possibility for the characters to detect the trap and to disable it or avoid it. Triggering a trap. Most traps are triggered when a creature goes somewhere or touches something that the trap's creator wanted to protect. Common triggers include stepping on a pressure plate or a false section of a floor, pulling a trip wire, turning a doorknob and using the wrong key in a lock. Magic traps are often said to go off when a creature enters an area or touches an object. Some magic traps, such as Glyph of Warding spell, have more complicated trigger conditions, including a password that prevents the trap from activating. So I thought about a um about an interesting trap of, of magical nature. I think one of the spells in the player's handbook 
I'm not sure if it's glyph or warding or something similar to it, but it allowed you to store a spell in it that triggers once the glyph is broken. That sort of deal. And I thought to myself, ah, would it be interesting if, uh, if some villain, or maybe even the players, used a spell that's not offensive on this glyph? For example, a Gias spell. Uh, and the Gias would tell whoever triggers the trap to guard the treasure until they're dead. His Gias doesn't run out, right? And what if an unwary adventurer triggered it and all of a sudden, one of the party members suddenly feels the urge to stay there forever and guard this uh, chest full of loot? That would be a problem. Even if they manage to stop him from attacking them in combat, what would they do to him? Obviously, when they have dispel magic, these sort of conundrums, they suddenly disappear from your game, but if they didn't... Huh? Interesting. You'd have to probably account for a way to, to actually somehow complete the adventure and somehow save that player, or else it would feel very unfair to the players, but I like the idea. Oh yeah, that like forcing the player to carry the chest with them and protect it that way, that's, a, that's an interesting way of uh, rules lawyering out of it, but it would work. You could make the player's companions convince that character to take the chest with them. Anyway, most traps are triggered when a creature goes somewhere. Or okay, we've read through that. Detecting and disabling a trap. Usually, some element of a trap is visible. To careful inspection, characters might notice an uneven flagstone that conceals a pressure plate. Spot the gleam of light off of a trip wire. Notice small holes in the walls from which jets of flame will erupt. Or otherwise detect something to point at the trap's presence. The trap's description specifies the checks and DCs needed to detect it, disable it, or both. A character actively looking for a trap can attempt a wisdom perception check against the trap's DC. You can also compare the DC to detect the trap with each character's passive wisdom perception score to determine whether anyone in the party notices the trap in passing. If the adventurers detect the trap before triggering it, they might be able to disarm it either permanently or long enough to move past it. You might call for an intelligence investigation check for a character to deduce what needs to be done, followed by a dexterity check using thieves tools to perform the necessary sabotage. Any character can attempt an intelligence arcana check to detect or disarm a magic trap, in addition to any other checks noted on the trap's description. The DCs are the same regardless of the check used. In addition, a dispel magic is a chance of disabling most magic traps with magic traps description provides the DC or the ability check made when you use Dispel Magic. In most cases, a trap's description is clear enough that you can adjudicate whether a character's actions locate or foil the trap. As with many situations, you shouldn't allow die rolling to override clever play and good planning. Use your common sense, drawing on the trap's description to determine what happens. No trap's design can anticipate every possible action that the characters might attempt. You should allow a player to discover a trap without making an ability check if an action clearly reveals the trap's presence. For example, if a character lifts a rug that conceals a pressure plate, the character has found the trigger and no check is required. Boiling traps can be a little more complicated. Consider a trapped treasure chest. If the chest is opened without first pulling on the two handles set in its sides, a mechanism inside fires a hail of poison needles toward anyone in front of it. After inspecting the chest and making a few checks, the characters are still unsure if it's trapped. Rather than simply open the chest, they prop a shield in front of it and push the chest open at a distance with an iron rod. In this case, the trap still triggers, but the hail of needles fires harmlessly into the shield. Traps are often designed with the mechanisms that allow them to be disarmed or bypassed. Intelligent monsters that place traps in or around their lairs need ways to get past those traps without harming themselves. Such traps might have hidden levers that disable their triggers, or a secret door might conceal a passage that goes around the trap. I like that they mention or a safe way into the lair or to open the chest because clearly the person who put something in there or who wants to get in there needs a way to do so. Trap effect the effects of traps can range from inconvenient to deadly, making use of elements such as arrows, spikes, blades, poison, toxic gas, blasts of fire, and deep pits. The different traps combine multiple elements to kill, injure, contain, or drive off any creature unfortunate enough to trigger them. 
A trap's description specifies what happens when it's triggered. The attack bonus of a trap, the save DC to resist its effect, and the damage it deals can vary depending on the trap's severity. Use the trap save DC and the attack bonuses table and the damage severity by level table for the suggestions based on three levels of trap severity. A trap intended to set back is unlikely to kill or seriously harm characters of the indicated levels, whereas a dangerous trap is likely to seriously injure and potentially kill characters of the intended levels. A deadly trap is likely to kill characters of the indicated levels. Trap save DCs and attack bonuses. Trap danger setback. 10 to DC. 10 to 11. Attack bonus. Plus 3 to plus 5. Dangerous. DC 12 to 15. Attack bonus plus 6 to plus 8. Deadly. DC 16 to 20. Attack bonus plus 9 to plus 12. Damage severity by level 1 to 4. Setback 1d10. Dangerous. 2d10. Deadly 4d10. Character level 5 to 10. Setback 2d10. Dangerous. 4d10. Deadly 10d10. Character level 11 to 16. Setback 4d10. Dangerous 10d10. Deadly 18d10. 18d10. Can you imagine rolling that many die in real life? That would be horrible. Anyway, character level 17 to 20. Setback 10d10. Dangerous 18d10. Deadly 24d10. Do you even own that many die? I bet nobody does. I mean, somebody does, I'm sure, but I don't. And I'm trying to project the feeling that you don't need all that many die to run a game, but clearly Wizards of the Coast disagree. Complex traps. Complex traps work like standard traps, except once activated, they execute a series of actions each round. A complex trap turns the process of dealing with a trap into something more like a combat encounter. When a complex trap activates, it rolls initiative. The trap's description includes an initiative bonus. On its turn, the trap activates again. Often making an action, it might make successive attacks against intruders, create an effect that changes over time or otherwise produce a dynamic challenge. Otherwise, the complex trap can be detected and disarmed or bypassed by the usual ways. For example, a trap that causes a room to slowly flood works best as a complex trap. On the trap's turn, the water level rises. After several rounds, the room is completely flooded. Sample traps, the magical and mechanical traps presented here, Vera in deadliness and are presented in alphabetical orders. I wonder if they're going to have all the classic ones. But one of my personal favorites is a room in a in a pyramid, for example. It's locked and it slowly fills with sand. It's a classic and it feels kind of nice. Well, it doesn't feel nice for the people in the room, but for the evil DM it feels kind of nice, I guess. I must be a wicked human being by now. Probably. Probably, maybe. Sample traps. The magical and mechanical traps presented here vary in deadliness and are presented in alphabetical order. Collapsing roof. Mechanical trap. This trap uses a tripwire to collapse the supports, keeping an unstable section of the ceiling in place. The tripwire is 3 inches of the ground and stretches between two support beams. The DC to spot the tripwire is 10. A successful DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools disables the tripwire harmlessly. A character without thieves tools can attempt this check with disadvantage using any edged weapons or edged tool. On a failed check, the trap triggers. Anyone who inspects the beams can easily determine that they are merely wedged in place. As an action, a character can knock over a beam, causing the trap to trigger. The ceiling above the trip wire is in bad repair, and anyone who can see it can tell that it's in danger of collapse. When the trap is triggered, the unstable ceiling collapses. Any creature in the area beneath the unstable ceiling must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, taking 22 4d10 bludgeoning damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. Once the trap is triggered, the floor of the area is filled with rubble and becomes difficult terrain. So wouldn't it be interesting if you, early on, if you gave your players a scroll of planar travel for example, and one planar travel tuning fork for a plane that's not so nice, for a plane that's pretty horrible, right? For a plane where they definitely don't want to go. And they'd keep it in their inventory for a long time, probably not use it, or they would sell it. But anyway, he could later on introduce traps like the trap I mentioned, where they become trapped in a room that slowly fills with, with sand, for example. Normally that would feel very unfair, right? Because if they trigger it, it's not a trap where you can take some damage. It's gonna suffocate you. So it's pretty hardcore. But at the same time, it looks very nice from an adventuring point of view. It, it's the sort of trap you'd see in a, in a movie, in an adventure feature film. 
So if they if they have a scroll of teleport or something, or preferably that planar scroll you gave them earlier on, and that tuning fork that takes them to a horrible place, the situation is suddenly not so bad. If they trigger the trap and they can't escape the room, they're not instantly dead, but they're punished nonetheless because they have to spend an expensive scroll. They are taken to a horrible place and they are forced to leave the dungeon behind because they have a suddenly they have a, a room filled with sand in the way. Whatever they enter the dungeon for is forfeit because they can't traverse that room anymore. So that's a pretty harsh punishment. And harsh punishments are fine every now and then for, for failing to stand up to the challenge, like a trap is meant to be a challenge. And if they do succeed, they avoid this horrible fate, right? They're rewarded in a way. And it's not a situation of life and death anymore. It's a situation of a bad outcome, admittedly a bad outcome, and a different track to the adventure. And a good outcome where they get into the treasure room of the place eventually. I like these sort of things. Challenges like that that can just put the campaign on a different set of rails if there's any rails to a campaign anyhow. Falling net. Mechanical trap. This trap uses a tripwire to release a net suspended from the ceiling. The tripwire is 3 inches off the ground and stretches between 2 columns or trees. The net is hidden by cobwebs or foliage. The DC to spot the tripwire and net is 10. A successful DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools breaks the tripwire harmlessly. A character without thieves tools can attempt this check with disadvantage using any edged weapons or edged tool. On a failed check the trap triggers. When the trap is triggered the net is released covering 10 foot square area. Those in the area are trapped under the net and restrained and those that fail the DC 10 saving throw are also knocked prone. A creature can use its action to make a DC 10 strength check freeing itself or another creature within its reach on a success. The net has AC 10 and 20 hit points, dealing 5 slashing damage to the net, AC 10, destroys 5 foot square section of it, freeing any creature trapped in that section. Fire breathing statue. The trap is activated when an intruder steps on a hidden pressure plate, releasing a magical gout of flame from a nearby statue. The statue can be of anything, including a dragon or a wizard casting a spell. The DC is 15 to spot the pressure plate, as well as faint scorch marks on the floor and walls. A spell or other effect can sense the presence of magic, such as detect magic, reveals an aura of evocation magic around the statue. The trap activates when more than 20 pounds of weight is placed on the pressure plate, causing the statue to release a 30 foot cone of fire. Each creature in the fire must make a DC 13 dexterity saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. Wedging an iron spike or other object on the pressure plate prevents the trap from activating. A successful dispel magic cast on the statue destroys the trap. Vandalism. How? Why would you destroy such a, such a clever thing? Someone had to make the sculpture and uh, then someone had to go to all the trouble to enchant it. Would be rude to just break it. Mechanical traps. Four basic pit traps are presented here. Simple pit. A simple pit trap is a hole dug in the ground. The hole is covered by a large cloth anchored on the pit's edge and camouflaged with dirt and debris. The DC to spot the pit is 10. Anyone stepping on the cloth falls through and pulls the cloth down into the pit, taking damage based on the pit's depth, usually 10 feet, but some pits are deeper. Hidden pit. This pit has a cover constructed from material identical to the floor around it. A successful DC 15 wisdom perception check discerns an absence of foot traffic over the section of floor that forms the pit's cover. A successful DC 15 intelligence investigation check is necessary to confirm that the trapped section of the floor is actually a cover of the pit. When a creature steps on the cover, it swings open like a trap door, causing the intruder to spill into the pit below. The pit is usually 10 or 20 feet deep, but can be deeper, and once the pit trap is detected, an iron spike or similar object can be wedged between the pit's cover and the surrounding floor in such a way as to prevent the cover from opening, thereby making it safe to cross. The cover can also be magically held shut using the arcane lock spell or similar magic. That's an interesting way of using the arcane lock. Locking pit. The pit trap is identical to a hidden pit trap with one key exception. The trap door that covers the pit is spring loaded. After a creature falls into the pit, cover snubs shot to trap its victim inside. A successful DC 20 strength check is necessary to pry the cover open. The cover can also be smashed to pieces. Determine the cover's statistic using the guidelines in chapter 8. A character in the pit 
can also attempt to disable the spring mechanism from the inside with a DC-15 dexterity check using thieves tools, provided that the mechanism can be reached and the character can see. In some cases, the mechanism, usually hidden behind the secret door nearby, opens the pit. Spiked pit. This pit trap is a simple, hidden or locking pit trap with sharpened wooden or iron spikes at the bottom. A creature falling into the pit takes 11 or 2d10 piercing damage from the spikes, in addition to any falling damage. Even nastier versions have poison smeared on the spikes. In that case, anyone taking piercing damage from the spikes must also make a DC 13 constitution saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 poison damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. You have to be such a tryhard to make a spiked pit and go to all the trouble to poison the spikes when probably just a height could kill a person. And then actually make the pit close when, when someone falls in. have to be such, a, such an evil DM and also a very little confidence in in your pits. Poison darts. Mechanical trap. When a creature steps on a hidden pressure plate, poison tipped darts shoot from spring loaded or pressurized tubes cleverly embedded in the surrounding walls. An area might include multiple pressure plates, each one rigged to its own set of darts. Tiny holes in the walls are obscured by dust or cobwebs, or cleverly hidden amid bas relief murals or frescoes that adorn the walls. The DC to spot them is 15. With a successful DC-15 intelligence investigation check, the character can deduce the presence of the pressure plate from variations in the mortar and stone used to create it, compared to the surrounding floor. Wedging an iron spike or other object under the pressure plate prevents the trap from activating. Stuffing the holes with cloth or wax prevents the darts contained within from launching. The trap activates when more than 20 pounds of weight is placed on the pressure plate, releasing four darts. Each dart makes a ranged attack with a plus 8 bonus against a random target within 10 feet of the pressure plate. Vision is irrelevant to this attack roll. If there are no targets in the area, the darts don't hit anything. A target that is hit takes 2 or 1d4 piercing damage and must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw, taking 11 or 2d10 poison damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. Poison Needle A poison needle is hidden within a treasure chest's lock or in something else that the creature might open. Opening a chest without the proper key causes the needle to spring out, delivering a dose of poison. When the trap is triggered, the needle extends 3 inches straight out from the lock. A creature within range takes 1 piercing damage and 11 or 2d10 poison damage and must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw or be poisoned for 1 hour. A successful DC-20 intelligence investigation check allows the character to deduce the trap's presence from alterations made to the lock to accommodate the needle. A successful DC-15 dexterity check using thieves tools disarms the trap, removing the needle from the lock and successfully attempting to pick the lock triggers the trap. So the intelligence DC to, to determine whether there is a trap on the, on the door's lock is pretty high. A DC of 20 is much higher than a DC of, of 15, so DC to disarm it, right? It's just 5 difference, but 20 sounds kind of... have to roll very well or be a character with very high start, I guess. Rolling Sphere When 20 or more pounds of pressure are placed on this trap's pressure plate, a hidden trapdoor in the ceiling opens, releasing a 10-foot diameter rolling sphere of solid stones. That's a classic. With a successful DC 15 wisdom perception check, the character can spot the trapdoor and pressure plate. A search of the floor accompanied by a successful DC-15 intelligence investigation check reveals variations in the mortar and stone that betray pressure plate's presence. The same check made while inspecting the ceiling and those variations in the stonework that reveals the trapdoor, wedging an iron spike or other object under the pressure plate, prevents the trap from activating. Activation of the sphere requires all creatures present to roll initiative. The sphere rolls initiative with a plus 8 bonus. On its turn, it moves 60 feet in a straight line. The sphere can move through creatures' spaces, and creatures can move through its space, treating it as difficult terrain. Whenever the sphere enters a creature's space, or creature enters its space while it's rolling, that creature must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, or take 55 or 10d10 bludgeoning damage, and be knocked prone. The sphere stops when it hits a wall or a similar barrier. 
It can't go around corners, but smart dungeon builders incorporate gentle, curving turns into nearby passages that allow the sphere to keep moving. As an action, a creature within 5 feet of the sphere can attempt to slow it down with a DC 20 strength check. On a successful check, the sphere's speed is reduced by 15 feet. If the sphere's speed drops to zero, it stops moving and is no longer a threat. How beefy would you have to be to stop the sphere? And would you still take damage when it hits you? You might, actually. Don't know. Fear of Annihilation. Magic Trap. Magical, impenetrable darkness fills the gaping mouth of a stone face carved into a wall. The mouth is two feet in diameter and roughly circular. No sound issues from it. No light can illuminate the inside of it. And any matter that enters it is instantly obliterated. A successful DC-20 intelligence arcana check reveals that the mouth contains a sphere of annihilation that can't be controlled or moved. It is otherwise identical to a normal sphere of annihilation as described in Chapter 7 Treasure. Normal sphere of annihilation. Ah, there's normal spheres of annihilation. Everybody knows what they do. Some versions of the trap include an enchantment placed on the stone face such that specified creatures feel an overwhelming urge to approach it and crawl inside its mouth. This effect is otherwise like the sympathy aspect of the antipathy sympathy spell. A successful dispel magic, DC 18, removes this enchantment. That's an interesting one. The sympathy thing where a creature feels the urge to crawl inside. It's kind of dark and it has a certain classical fantasy charm to it. It does feel like a, like a dark spell would feel. I like that idea. And with this ends our read-along of chapter 5. If you liked it, please consider leaving a like or visiting my Twitch. Link in the description. Thank you for watching and may you never feel the compulsion to crawl into a sphere of annihilation. Have a great day. Bye.